I think the uh, mic's on, I can hear that. Um, can I start by saying a big thank you to uh, our students, Mustafa, uh, Christabel, is it, oh, forgive me, Isabel and Joe, told you about that names, uh, for organising and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I guess it's the graveyard shift in a sense, it's only one, one day symposium. Uh, but I'm going to try to show you my locker of skeletons and try to show you why they're interesting, OK? Um, and I work quite a lot with either droplets on surfaces or liquids flowing across surfaces. But I usually describe myself as the guy who lives at the interface between the two. I crawl along that surface where liquids are. Okay. And there's lots of people who've contributed to what I'm going to talk about uh, in different universities. What about motivation? This guy, uh, Pierre Gilles de Gen, got the Nobel Prize. He's known for soft matter. He's known for his work on reputation uh, in uh, polymers. But you also have a little bit of the citation for his Nobel Prize about the wettability of surfaces. And this is a quote from his memorial lecture. Okay. So he says, the borders between great empires are often populated by the most interesting ethnic groups. Similarly, the interfaces between two forms of bulk matter are responsible for some of the most unexpected actions. And he went on to say, of course, the border is sometimes frozen. It's a great Chinese wall. But in many areas, this overlap region is mobile, it's diffuse, it's active. The Middle East border and the Roman Empire disputed say it's between Austria and the Russians or Italians. And I guess that describes liquids on surfaces. There's a border somewhere, which is the edge of the liquid, and you know, next to that is air, and underneath is solid, possibly. It doesn't have to be a solid. And it's not static, but it's quite mobile. And so I like that because it really summarizes a lot of what I think and do. And I'm sort of working in engineering, so why should engineers be interested in interfaces? Well, I guess friction is one of the reasons. It's responsible for about a third of the world's energy consumption. Friction. Okay. And obviously you have solid on solid friction, but you also have liquid friction. And I'm interested in the liquid friction. So it's not a surprise that the UN Sustainable Development Goals have one goal, 7.3, around energy efficiency. What about solid liquid interfaces? So if I come from the engineering side, you, you can't escape them. anti fouling you know, you have pipes, you transport liquids through pipes, you move ships through the oceans, okay? You have catheters and you have the inside of cap, you, you have fouling. It's to do with the liquid at the interface with the solid. You have anti-icing, you know, drops impact on surfaces and may rebound or may freeze. You have pylons, big problem in Canada. You know, renewables, wind turbines. I've just come back from Vancouver. Someone says out there, four months of the year. That's when they're on their wind turbines because they have problems with icing. Uh, drag and friction, food, packaging, residue. Try to empty a ketchup bottle and get the last residue out. It's a sort of soft matter, solid interface. Marine, oil and water, microsystems, uh, phase change. You can look at heat and mass transfer, cooling. You can look at printing. Droplets in printing and other parts, self cleaning surfaces, windscreens of cars. You can't get away from it. Liquid surface interactions, they underpin a lot of our technologies, our emerging technologies. Actually, they're also pervasive in life. So, you know, I often see things like this in the literature that I deal with. Can we move liquids around either through maybe a gradient in the roughness of the surface, the texture of the surface? Maybe we can levitate a droplet on a sort of vapour layer under what's called the Leiden frost effect. Maybe we can use vibration to move things. Maybe we create a gradient along a surface in the chemistry and the droplet moves along that gradient to the area of greater wettability where it wants to spread out more. Or maybe a temperature gradient to drive or maybe use electric fields. There's many different ways we might think about moving liquids and droplets. And so drop when you think of those sorts of problems, it's natural to start to think of friction. What's the force that you've got to apply to overcome something? Static friction force to get something moving. What's the force you need to apply to keep something moving? Okay, but friction is not so often talked about with liquids and droplets. If I think about the world around us, this, this is my former house down in Nottingham. 
you know, I used to go in the garden and you could look and see plants and leaves. And of course, water falls on those. Or you might have channels, you know, little, little shoot here and you have water going across it and you have the pond there and the insects. You have clothes on the clothesline, drying. You've got the soil. You've got windows and roofs. So you've got the natural world and you've got the man-made world. And all over when you look, you will find liquids, typically water, interacting with the surface. So here's, here's a video, the first video. Let's see whether it works. I hope you can hear that. On skeleton. It's sat, isn't it, with its feet on the water, and each foot is creating a dimple. It's not going into the water, it's on the top, as if it's a sort of mattress. And it spotted something, another insect. But an insect that's not adapted itself to the surface of the water. So unfortunately, very gruesomely, that second insect is trapped at the water-air interface. It can't move, it can't get out, and it's been held. And so you've got winners and losers here, and the winner is the insect that's adapted to the world of the water-air interface. Okay. And you sort of know that. If you look at your sort of window on a rainy day, then after the rain's fallen, you have small drops on a vertical window. You've got a force of gravity, but the force of gravity isn't causing the droplet to slide down or roll down, whichever one you want to choose as a fluid down the cesk. It's not, it's stuck there. It's stuck there. It's just sat there until it grows big enough that it can overcome the thing that's pinning it, even though the wind is vertical and can start to move down. So we know friction exists and we know that kind of things happens. Here's an example. Great cartoon from the movie Ants. I'm not breaking copyright because I'm going to criticise it and it's only a short clip. There's an exception for that. I hope the sound is going to be good enough. No, nope, the sound isn't. How do we turn the sound up? Mm. How do I turn the sound up? Sound up. Yeah, going to deafen you now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's just reproject. I'm going to go straight past that one, and I'm going to hope this is going to be loud enough for you to hear. If it isn't, it's a cartoon, isn't it? Really like that. It's imagination. It's imagination. And actually, you look at the date on it, 1996. It's before something called the Lotus Effect was published. And yet it is essentially what's called the Lotus Effect. Okay. And someone had that imagination. And there's a huge amount of science in there. You know, the droplet is on the leaf. And you know, it's completely balled up. That's suspicious. The most you can do with surface chemistry on a smooth flat surface is what Teflon does for water, which is about a half of a sphere, just over half of a sphere. You don't wall up completely on smooth Teflon. That's most water repellent chemistry you can have. And yet here, the droplet's completely balled up. It can roll easily. There's no real obstruction to that. And of course, once your ant is encaptured, <laughs> you know, that mechanical force of bashing really struggles to get through the surface of the water. Surface tension, the skin effect of water. It's really strong compared to the mechanical force. And that's the imagination in the Ants movie. OK, you've seen that. But is it just imagination? Two videos not intended. So here's a real video. 
Ignore my first one. Ignore my, uh, look at my second one. This second one. That's a real M. And that's a real water drop. Look how hard it's trying to get out. It's struggling. Interface is something. Mechanical forces struggling. They didn't succeed. So it's not just imagination. You saw just there, you saw the water drop was rolling around on the surface, and you saw that mechanical forces could be overcome by the forces of surface tension, the interface between water and air. Okay. So it's not just imagination. And of course, going back to that chase of one effect of the other, the pond skater, the pond skater on the top of the water, right? It tells you a little bit why for insects it's really important they understand how to adapt themselves to that interface. And there's a very simple reason from it. Here's a sort of simplistic view. The force of surface tension scales linearly with size. It's a force per unit length. So on this graph is the pinky red line. I'm no good with colors. It's the straight line. That is surface tension as a force scaling with size. But if you think of gravity, you've got mass times acceleration due to gravity, and a mass is a density times a volume. And whether you're dealing with a sphere with four thirds pi r cubed, or whether you're dealing with a cube with length, width, height, it's a cube. And the cube form is that blue. You know this, you know, if you take one and cube it, you get one. If you take point one and cube it, you get point zero zero one. It gets small very, very fast when you cube something. And so there's a crossover in forces where those curves cross, which for water occurs at 2.73 millimeter, uh, millimeters. If you are on a length scale less than 2.73 millimeters, 10% of it, 0.273 millimeters, 10% rule, then surface tension is far more dominant than gravity. Okay, 273 microns, forget gravity. If you're interacting, it's going to be surface tension if you're a liquid. Okay. Different liquids have slightly different scales. But there. And that's why those insects that are very small have to adapt themselves to water air interfaces. Because the sizes are below this size. So you can look at the two and you end up with something that's called capillary length, 2.73 millimetres by comparing the forces. And if you're a lot less than that, a tenth of it or less, then surface tension is what dominates your world. Okay? And that's the world I live in. Well, surface tension is about the liquid air interface. But in reality, you might have a drop of a liquid on a solid surface. And so you don't just have a surface tension, you have three interfacial tensions. You have the one from the liquid to the air. You have the one from the solid to the air. You have the one from the solid to the liquid. And how those three forces forces per unit length balance out will shape liquids. So if you look at a fence such as this one, then on the link joint, you can see the droplets distorted because there's three solid sort of legs right now. If you look at the thread going down the center, which is from a spider, then there's a drop of liquid on there and essentially it balls up. Okay, It's essentially as if it was in free space and the smallest surface area for the volume is a sphere. So it's trying to minimize surface area on that one. So at small scales, it's interfacial tensions. Okay, so bit of stuff about the natural world. What about friction? This is a paper published in Nature Physics uh, not that many years ago, 2018. We started really thinking seriously about the concept of friction. But the concept of friction sort of in analogy to solids. It's from a German group led by Hans-Jürgen Boot. And they basically said, well, actually, if you get a droplet on a surface and you put a cantilever needle into it, you start to move the substrate, then the cantilever bends because the drop's trying to move it. But initially, the drop doesn't move. Not the base of it. It might distort its shape a little bit, but the base of it sticks until you get enough force, at which point the drop leaves relative to the substrate. Okay. 
And he said, if you look at that and ask the question, how much force do you need before that first motion of the base happens? It's a bit more than the force you've got after the motion started. That's to say there's a static friction and there's a kinetic friction. Okay, fairly simple observation, but no one had really, as far as I know, put it into writing. And they did the experiments behind it. So here's a bit of maths, but only a bit. Here's a droplet, two dimensional, looking sideways. Orange is the solid, blue is the drop, obvious coding colors there. And the three interfacial tensions, the gammas, they're the force per unit length of what you call the contact line, one from the droplet to the gas, one from the substrate or the solid to the droplet, and one from the solid to the gas. And what will happen is the droplet will adjust itself on the contact line until it comes to equilibrium. I can think of it as a mechanical equilibrium where those three forces, they're projections into the horizontal balance. And that gives me something called Young's law. Or I can say it's to do with the energy per unit area and minimize an energy. Either way, Young in 1805 sort of came up with this law. He said that if you take the gamma dg and you project it horizontally, so gamma times cos theta, and you add on the other force in that direction, gamma sd, it's got to balance out the solid to the gas. And you rearrange that, and you get an angle. And that's essentially representing the material properties. It's representing the chemistry of the surface and also what liquid you are using. And so the equilibrium angle, fantastic, characterizes your interaction with your liquid, your solid. That's what I call my left hemisphere of my brain. Perfect surface, no heterogeneity, no roughness, no variation in chemistry, ideal world, works fabulously, never observed until recently. But roughly it works. Left half brain, textbook world. Funnily enough, if you put a droplet on a surface like a window, it doesn't go down the window. If Young's law held, your droplet would never just stick on the window. It'd slide. Smallest force would cause it to move down. Now it doesn't. So if you take a drop and put it on a surface, you put a syringe in and you just increase the volume, what will happen is the volume increases and initially the contact line can't move. And so the angle increases. But eventually there's enough force there to force the contact line to start moving. The last angle you measure before that motion is called the advancing angle. You can do the other. You can out, suck out the liquid. Angles come down, contact line doesn't move. Eventually enough force starts to retract. Last angle before it starts to retract, the receded angle. That's the real world, right hemisphere brain, the one I live in, the one where drops don't just slide down windows, the stick. Okay. And there's a range of angles, therefore, which are centered around the hypothetical equilibrium from my left brain, okay, which is called the hysteresis. Okay. That means if I take a droplet on a surface and I tilt the surface, the droplet leans, the front angle gets larger, the back angle gets smaller, until that lean gives enough force to overcome the advancing and receding angles, and the whole thing moves. And there's a formula for that, right brain formula. The force that you have to pin is basically the cos theta projected into the plane at one side, minus the cos theta projected into the plane on the other side to find out what the unbalanced force is. Okay? Times, obviously, the gamma is what you're projecting down, times some overall constant, times the width of the drop. So it depends upon the width of the drop. K is a shape factor, right brain. Interesting, isn't it? In my field, we sometimes sit in left-hand world, sometimes in right-hand world, and we choose which one we use. There. And yet they don't seem to be together. And for years and years, we've all done that. We just accept that you use the one on the right when you're interested in pinning things not moving, overcoming forces on that. So we do need to overcome contact line pinning, that's to say reduce this hysteresis to initiate drop motion. So let's go back to solids on solids. I had to remind myself of this. I'm sure I did it when I was 13, 14. Here's my brick. Okay? Here's my brick. Put it down and push. And until I get over a threshold, it doesn't move. When it does move, I have to keep pushing to keep it going. Okay? Just a brick. 
And you know that when you do that, your force increases to some maximum at which point the brick moves and then it falls back to a different force, which is the one you need to keep it moving. And as long as you don't go too fast, that sort of force you need to keep moving, the coefficient for that is. Uh, interestingly, if you put the brick down on there, you need to apply the same force. Doesn't depend upon that area underneath. I can put it down on any of those edges and my coefficient of friction will be the same. Interesting. I'd forgotten about that. I had to go and remind myself. Okay. Um, so the empirical laws, and these are empirical laws of solid on solid sort of friction, date back a long time. Okay. So the work of Amundsen's, preceded by Leonardo da Vinci. And Hamilton's first two laws were friction force is proportional to the normal load, and the friction force is independent of the apparent contact area. Essentially, it said the force in plane, this way, the frictional force, depends upon this force coming down, and the thing that translates this force down into the plane is the coefficient of friction. Okay. Essentially, that's what it says. The two are linked by the coefficient of friction. There's my brick. And there, coefficient static kinetic friction. That formula holds, but you have to use two different coefficients, the mu's in this formula. Okay, so these are long established. So let's go back to droplets. This is our sort of force equation that we had. Cosines. Go back a little bit. First year at university. Taylor expansions. If I know that the advancing angle is a little bit above the equilibrium, the receding angle is a little bit low, I can expand around the equilibrium angle. If I take a cos theta and expand, I'll get a cos theta at the equilibrium plus a small variation in angle times the sine theta. But I'm subtracting two things so I can ignore the constant. One's a sort of variation above, one's a variation below, therefore it's really just the overall variation times the sine theta. That's all this has done. It's a Taylor expansion. But interestingly, it's given me the hysteresis of the surface, delta theta, that range of angles. It's also given me a sine theta. That's suspicious. Here's my surface tension. Get the force in plane, that's the cosine. Get the force vertical, is the sine. So if I think of this figure, then the vertical force is this. The capillary force, the component vertically, pulling on the substrate, upwards is given by the surface tension times the sine times the width of the drop times the pi. So if I take that out, I write like this, oh, I can define a coefficient of friction. And that coefficient of friction is the hysteresis on the surface. And that tells me quite a lot because it says I can make the normal force vanish and I get rid of friction. I can make the normal force vanish by making a drop spherical. If my angle goes to 180 degrees, I get rid of the normal force. Or I can make my surface completely homogeneous. So I don't have hysteresis. Get rid of the roughness, get rid of the variation surface chemistry. Either of those will work and both will give me a low friction surface. It's interesting, isn't it, by the way? Solid on solid is force pressing down from gravity. Reaction of the table upwards is compressive. Force here is upwards, reaction of the table is this way, it's an adhesive force. And actually, you can relate this to the work of adhesion. So you can define a coefficient of static liquid friction, uh, and you can do that. And so if you look at those experiments from the German group, droplet, cantilever in the droplet, move the substrate until your cantilever moves, fill everything you can so you know all of the shape parameters, Measure the force in your cantilever, you get this. Force with time changes. The blue is the experimental data. The black and the uh, and the open circles are the fits of that Amonton's law. The static regime is this part. That's the bit before it moves. And the bit afterwards is the kinetic after the droplets move in. And yeah, it works. It does. And you can therefore derive different types of surfaces and different liquids on surfaces coefficients of static and kinetic friction. And actually, you can even come up with the reason why they're different, because if you shape the liquid to have the shape it will have when it's in motion, you get rid of the peak. If you pre-shape, 
to your kinetic, your dynamic equilibrium shape, you can get rid of the peak. It's essentially a rearrangement energy for the configuration. Um, okay, so you can do all of that. So two ingredients actually in, in friction for liquids or for droplets. One's the wettability of the surface. Left brain, perfect world wettability. Okay, perfect world of hysteresis. Second bit is surface heterogeneity. How does the surface vary due to its roughness, due to its chemistry? So we have a bit of wettability on one side, which is related to the addition, the liquid addition on the surface. On the other side, we have the surface heterogeneity and they conspire to project your normal force in play and give you friction. So the two things appear to be pretty related. Okay. And we can reduce therefore friction for a droplet on a substrate through two different ways or a combination. And I should say it doesn't really just apply to droplets. If you think of contact lines, so you think of a liquid flowing down a tube where there's a front edge to it, then you can do the same. You can come up with a coefficient friction for that. So ooh, part three, strategies. Okay. Six strategies. The lotus effect. Lotus effect means we structure a surface, make it hydrophobic, and a droplet will boil up magically on the surface and just roll across it. That's the lotus effect. Really, what we're doing is getting rid of the normal force and actually trying to reduce the hysteresis at the same time. Um, that's a lotus leaf with a drop of water in, filling it out loud. You can think of a drop of water like a balloon. The surface of the balloon is the skin effect of water. And if you push that balloon against the bed of nails, you spread the force across all the tips. You don't penetrate through the interface and you ball up. If you just do that against one nail, penetration, thing pops. Water drops don't quite pop, but it's there. And lotus effect is essentially a bed of nails effect. Okay. So it's just a bed of, a, of nails effect. We very early on in, in our work made these long time ago using lithographic methods. And you can do a sort of lithographic surface using your favourite material, which looks like a bunch of nails. You can put a droplet on top of that, make sure it's hydrophobic, and the droplet bubbles up. You can um, do what I call chock chip cookies. You can take a surface like copper and you can deposit little copper bits around the surface. And again, if you get the length scales right, you make sure it's all hydrophobic, your droplet will stay on the tips. Okay. You can do this one, craters. You can etch a surface and create etching. And this image uh, shows the surface on the top. Below is, the, is, is a droplet on just the hydrophobic surface and a droplet on the etched surface. Looks great, doesn't it? Took me, well, I did this with an undergraduate student, one of the first surfaces I made. Did it as a project. Then I got an EPSA grant and employed a postdoc who took nine months to repeat it. And the reason? My undergraduate smoked. He say etching, he went <laughs> outside and he came back and he lost track of time. And so the actual surface wasn't quite that one. It was the one where all those craters joined up and there were really jagged peaks in between. So a postdoc didn't smoke, undergrad did. Postdoc was a good guy, probably lived a long time. Undergrad made a scientific achievement. Not a proof, but there you are. Okay, and you sort of, sort of Think about what's happening there, which is if you make a bed of nails, one way of thinking about it is that you've essentially got a fraction of your solid surface area that's the solid, that's the tips, and you've got a fraction that's the air in between. Now, if you hang a droplet just in air, like on that thread from the spider, it completely boils up because it minimizes its surface area to volume ratio. Okay. Of course, on the solid, it wants to spread out into its equilibrium shape, which would be less. So if you put a droplet on the tips of these spikes, it will be a weighted average of what you get. But the weighted average you take is of the cosine of the angles. And the cosine of 180 degrees, air falling up is 180 degrees, is minus one. And so all that equation says is you've got to do a weighted average according to your solid surface fraction of what you'd get on a smooth surface and what you'd have if you just sat on the air. Uh, you can make really durable surfaces now. So if you sort of create a structure which isn't going to abrade very easily, but then fill it with real sort of hydrophobic particles, but you've protected them by the armour of the underneath structure, you can make a really good super hydrophobic surface now, an armoured surface. 
Um, these surfaces are really good. Things like drop impact. This is from David Carey in Paris. This is a super hydrophobic surface and water drop impact in complete rebound. The beautiful surfaces. There are lots of other really pretty videos on it. But the surfaces reduce friction. Uh, we did a number of work. This is one of my long lost postdocs um, where we were interested in what happens when you take one of those surfaces and put it underwater. When you put it underwater and you look down at it, you'll find it looks really silver at the surface. And the reason for that is underwater retains a layer of air and you see the reflection of light. So if you've ever been swimming in a swimming bath and underwater, you look up at the top surface of the water, it looks like a mirror. It's to do with how the light reflects. Okay. And so we took this big tube. Initially, it was the white one from local brickworks, I think it was. Then we bought the uh, transparent tube. Uh, and then we realized we were going to flood our lab, so we put it in a big, big bucket as well as sealing it just in case. And we did a number of experiments. We took these little spheres, probably that sort of diameter. We put sand on them to give it some roughness. We made them hydrophobic and we released them and measured the terminal velocity near the bottom of the tube. And these videos are three videos that they are medium video of 10 for each video, and then they've been aligned. And the first one is just the solid sphere. The second one is the super hydrophobic sphere, whereby the roughness and the hydrophobicity keeps a layer of air around it. And the third one was a little trick from biology where you take one of those spheres, you swish it around in ethanol, which is a low source of tension liquid. It goes into all the nooks and crannies, and then you swish it around in water to replace it, then you drop it. So you have exactly the same surface, but you get rid of the air. And you know, you do have a perceptible difference in terminal velocity. A sphere with air around it can fall faster than one without. Interesting, isn't it? Buoyancy is overcome by the reduction of drag. The more buoyant sphere falls faster. Okay? But that's because they're out. And uh, so that's some of our work, and you can see that. You can do that even better than we did. And there's a group at Kaust in Saudi Arabia. Um, Vekarelsky was the person who did this um, in a group. And what they did was create a perfect layer of air. And they used something called the line of frost effect. Very similar idea, though. It's the idea of a layer of air around. And they did that by heating the surface so that the fluid immediately vaporizes on contact. And you just keep a layer of vapor around. Uh, it's not air, but it's a layer of vapor around. And then they allowed the sphere just sit there until it cooled. And so what you're seeing is that silvery reflection and that very smooth surface. Now you see it cool, and so you break up into bubbles and there. Okay. And they did this experiment, a bit like ours. You know? It's a bit better than ours. That's a heck of a drag reduction. Heck of a drag reduction. Worked brilliantly. Works brilliantly. It's the, probably the highest drag reduction I know. And it's caused by having a layer of air around your solid. And that allows you to essentially lubricate the motion of your sphere through. Okay? And as long as you don't have surfactants or things rigidifying your interface between your vapor and your fluid, then you will get something called Hadamard Brzezinski drag if you're in the low Reynolds number regime, not Stokes drag. Of course, this is not low Reynolds number. There was a hint of stuff in our experiment because you saw the sphere for this and it's to do with the vortices. So if you do a little, little simulation, you can think of the sphere. I'm afraid I've got flow coming along. What you've got is the red line shows the normal situation of a solid liquid interface where you have an attached vortex. This is the Reynolds number regime where you have that. I think it's about 100. The bottom blue is what happens if you put in your model a layer of air and you just completely suppress that. And you sort of understand then what's happening here because the width of that bubble sort of bit at the back is telling you how much drag you have. Okay. And you can suppress that. Um, so air of vapor layers, uh, what we call plastrons, lubricate motion through liquids, giving giant drag reduction. Plastrons is a specific term in biology about how insects can breathe underwater without having to have gills. But actually, you can also show that you get drag reduction. I don't know whether I'm running over. Um, you can think of boundary conditions because if you think of a super hydrophobic surface, then you can think of the flow patterns in there. And actually, there's two different possibilities on your boundary conditions. 
One is that in your boundary layer, you keep a pressure gradient the same as your bulk. But the other one is that you keep the volume the same. So in other words, you have a recirculation of the air. As the liquid flows past the air interface, there's a shear stress that you transmit across. That then creates a flow within the vapor, and you get that. So you can put up a model of this, and you can do an analytical model, uh, which is valid at lower end those number of a sphere with a vapor layer in a liquid. Uh, at higher Reynolds numbers, you can do numerical calculations. You can work out slip lengths. OK, uh, strategies two and three, cool and aphids and super hot frying pans. Okay. These are all strategies to try to make your liquids ball up. Okay. Cool in aphids, very interesting. <laughs> this is a goal in aphid. They secrete out of their back end a sugary solution, and they live in a goal on the planet, and if they're not careful, they are going to get into a mess, a sticky mess in their goal. So they've got to handle that. Or not as the case may be. What they do is they have hydrophobic powder, which as they excrete, as they excrete the honeydew, the waste, this sugary waste, the hydrophobic powder coats the surface of that liquid. And then they push literally these balls out of their nest. They just push it, they roll it. They've converted their liquid air interface into a solid air interface, a soft solid. And you can reproduce that very easily. And there's a bit of easy maths you can do. You can ask about the energies for having a solid and a liquid. And what happens if you attach the solid to the liquid? And you can say, well, is the surface energies of these two situations, how does it change? Is it favorable? or unfavorable energetically to attach your solid. And when you work it through, the change in surface free energy, delta F, depends upon the radius of your particle, depends on the surface tension, but remarkably, it depends upon one plus the cosine of that equilibrium angle or sweat. It's a square. Can't go negative, it's a square. Okay. Can't go negative. And yet the overall sign on that is minus. Hmm. It's always favorable, always. If you have a spherical particle to attach it to a water air interface, always, okay, always favorable. Okay. All solids, including those that we call hydrophobic, hydro water, phobic theory, water fearing solids, really like to attach to water air interfaces. It's amazing how language misdirects us. Hydrophobic solid, quite likes. Water. Okay. A lot of chemists didn't like me saying that, but it's true. And it's very easy to show, and you can show it experimentally. Okay. So if you take a powder of hydrophobic particles, let's assume they are spherical, and you roll a drop of water around, it will naturally cause those particles to attach to the surface, and you'll naturally encapsulate that droplet. Okay. And I wasn't the person, by the way, who came up with this, David Carey. Brands first popularized things called liquid marbles, but you can make this. It's a version of what the chemists have as emulsions, pickering emulsions. But what you've really done is you've overcome your friction by making a solid solid contact, not a solid liquid contact. Okay. Um, actually, it's quite interesting. I'll go back to my window. If your window's full of dust and it rains and your droplet starts to pick up those particles, it'll roll down, it'll clean your window. So the lotus effect surfaces are self-cleaning under the action of rain, because when the water rolls off, it takes with it all the contaminants. Okay. And you can do other things like looking at how liquid marbles roll down an inclined surface, and they have some interesting properties, like the smaller ones roll faster. And there's some interesting fluid mechanics underneath that. Um, so solid liquid addition leads to self-cleaning surfaces and the removal of hydrophobic particles. Glide and frost, frying pan world. If I take water and I touch it against the frying pan, put water on it, it's going to evaporate. No big secret. Okay. I start to heat my pan to hotter temperatures, so I put the water down. Of course, it's going to evaporate faster when I put the water in. But if I get up to towards 200 Celsius and I do that experiment, the water drop evaporates more slowly. And the reason is, as soon as the water drop touches the surface of the pan, 
completely vaporizes an interspatial layer of water. Vaporizes it means the water is now on a layer of vapor. Vapor is a poor thermal conductor. So the lifetime of the water drop goes up and it doesn't evaporate as fast. Well known effect. And that's what this graph shows. And the picture on the right is a droplet levitating on that layer of air. Of course, it's all completely balled up now. It's not a layer of air. It rolls around. It's frictionless almost. So it's also linked to friction. So you get that. We did some work on that. And okay, we can levitate. We know that. This is a really hot plate, and that's a drop of water. My colleague Gary Wells did the work experimentally. Um, if you ratchet the surface, the vapor underneath starts to be directed and you can start to create a pull on the other side of, of the droplet. And of course, if you make not just a ratcheted surface, but you <laughs> wrap it around, you can start to get things like droplets doing orbits. Or if you put a solid plate on the top and use the liquid adhesion to hold the solid, then it'll turn into a rotation. OK. And you don't have to use the liquid. You can use sublimation if you use dry ice. So you put dry ice down, you'll have a vapor layer underneath. And if it's a ratchet to the surface, it, it'll all go around. OK, so you can create rotation. And if you want to be. Well, you want to show something, you could convert that into a motor. It's the world's worst, most inefficient motor. 10 to the minus six, seven, eight, nine. I don't know. It's the world's worst. But of course, there are places where your natural resources are ices. In space. Planetary bodies, you don't have to transport your material and you've got plenty of heat differences. So there are situations, but it is the first example, I think, of a sublimation heat energy. And I think it is the first one. Um, so you can go almost coming through. Pitch your plants. Okay. This is not where you ball up. This is where you don't worry about whether you can ball or drop it up, but you try to create your homogeneous surface. OK, and well, what do you know? This is from Harvard. <laughs> they pointed this out in a letter to nature. They said picture plants. Look, you know, that's the picture of a plant and the ants are sort of nicely walking around. And yet picture plants are carnivorous. They eat those insects because they cause them to drop into the picture where there's digestive juices. On it. So if you look at this one, well, now that's what should happen. Those ants, once they go off the rim, they just slip. There is no friction. They just slip. And what's going on is that the ants essentially use liquid addition on the little feet, with a little bit of oil effectively, which adheres to the solid surface, and that's what gives them their addition. What the pitcher plant does is it structures its surface at a very small scale and it makes it hydrophilic. And what that does is it allows it to retain a layer of water. Oil and water don't mix. You try walking with oil and water. Certainly not going to happen. Okay? And so you start to slip. So it's a trick on that. Okay? So that's what the pitcher plant's doing here is keeping a layer of water as a lubricant. Now we switch that round and we make a surface hydrophobic some structure. We put the oil in as the lubricant and then we have water on top. Could do it the other way, but that's what we normally do. So you can have a liquid lubricant contact. So it's really my super hydrophobic surface. Previously, air was the lubricant. Now I put the oil in as the lubricant. Okay, it's the same idea. And sometimes that oil <laughs> likes to go across the top of the water, so it may or may not also cause a film of the water. Or it may not completely coat the tops of the nails. It may go over the water. So there's slightly different sort of versions that you can have. And you can start to go back to Young's law. And you can define a Young's law. For a droplet on a liquid surface. Very, very thin liquid surface. Different way of thinking of liquids on solids. You can start to define the surface energy and wettability of thin liquid films. Thin lubricant films, and we've done some of that with Halim, piece of larger at uh, Durham. OK, I'm not going to say too much. We make things substrate. We put down hydrophobic nanoparticles from spray. We put an oil on the top. 
and we get a slippery liquid infused porous surface. We use lithography, create a sort of micron structure surface, put hydrophobic coating on, put oil on it, and we get a slip surface. OK, um, so we do that. If you do that, then on a microscope slide, your water drop is very mobile. You can see it moving very easily. Um, you can see what happens if you tilt at a very small angle. But you do see sometimes this little flaring at the edge, and that's the oil being pulled up onto the water drop. So you get an apparent contact angle, and you can look at that. Um, the last strategy is to try to overcome the difficulties. That it's a good idea, but you can imagine, does the lubricant really stay where it should? If you're in Harvard, you write your paper for Lepton and Nature, you'll tell us all about the advantages. But you stay mum about the fact that if you try to use one of those in a catheter, the sheer stress of flow is going to start to pull the oil out, or you're going to get some loss of it. So how about having a lubricant and just attaching it to the surface, but keeping it liquid? A liquid light solid surface. Well, you can do that. You can do some chemistry, which essentially, first of all, puts your substrate, typically glass or silicon wafer, into a plasma to populate the surface with OH groups. You then essentially do a little bit of chemistry that causes covalent attachment, and you either connect a short polymer chain length or you grow a short polymer chain length, which is PDMS. But you don't cross-link because you want a lot of flexibility at the end of the chains, and you create a surface that doesn't really have heterogeneity. You've completely got rid of defects, and you don't grow it long enough to get roughness, and you don't cross-link to lose the flexibility. And if you do that, you get about a four nanometer thick layer that's hydrophobic. But if you look at, say, a water drop evaporating, there really is nothing that stops it moving the contact line. There's no static friction. OK. Um, and you can do various things to check that. OK, you can uh, therefore do six strategies. I talked about left brain world textbook, Young's Law. Um, I might sort of erode away the surface, make it hydrophobic, make sure the water doesn't penetrate in so I get a better nails effect. That's a reducing the liquid solid contact. I might think of those nails as really weakly attached to the substrate such that the liquid can rip them up. And if it does, then I get a liquid marble and that's a solid solid contact. I might think, well, in between the nails is air. That's really a lubricant. So let me replace the air by a liquid lubricant, an oil. And that's the sort of what we call a hemiwick surface. Um, it might be the lubricant uh, fully coats the tops of the nails rather than just coming up and not quite. So there's a slightly different version there, fully lubricated. I might create an omniphobic liquid like uh, surface where we've covalently attached these short polymer chains that appear to behave just like a, a liquid layer, but one that's been immobilized from the point of view of wettability. Um, or I might use a vapor layer by manipulating the outer layer of the water drop to create a vapor layer. Okay, I get that. Okay, so six strategies there as a whole. Okay, um, very fl flavor. I'm going to finish soon. Uh, this is using um, a lubricators <laughs> where essentially we've just created a gradient in the surface in the proportion of the lubricant and air and you can get a droplet moving uphill you can get a droplet moving round a uh, circle or you can do it upside down because you've still got adhesion you can stick a droplet upwards it'll stick to the surface but it'll still move along the surface you can move either direction with your droplet so you get bi-directional motion uh, you can do all sorts of things i won't go through these so we've looked at all sorts of things as a whole this third one with vicky chen up at newcastle uh, is us looking at uh, anti-biofouling and this was initially with the liquid infused surfaces as a whole. You can also start to say are the natural places where this kind of stuff might happen. So for instance, if you go to Canada, you'll sometimes find that glaciers surge. They suddenly have motion that's much faster than they've had for the previous hundred years. And there's really interesting questions because they occur in tar sands. Lubricants, water, solids. Who knows? Speculative in there. Um, if I look at the uh, liquid like solid surfaces, this again with Vicky, 
This is a new strategy we published for anti-biofouling. So a liquid like solid surface. Okay. And it seems to work very well experimentally um, and various other things. OK, in summary, liquid solid Amundsen's laws of friction. Yes. We don't have to stick just with solids. We can think of empirical laws of friction of droplets and liquids, and we can think of static and kinetic friction. Um, nature inspired surfaces. Yeah, there's plenty of stuff out there to look at and think about. Uh, there's lots of applications, and I have not particularly focused on the real engineering applications, but there are applications. Out there. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed. I'd like to thank the funders, particularly EPSRC. Uh, I would. I didn't show this work, some of our other work. I'd like to smile and say thank you very much. I know it's the end of the day, but I hope that was of some interest. Thank you very much.